Um, and there, you might have seen a slightly alarming message when you when you joined um, to say that we are that it's streaming or something. That's just Otter transcription software. It's not streaming anywhere. I do wish they would change the message because I do think it's a bit alarming. Um, but yeah, we're going to get started in just a moment. OK, so we've given people a chance and we'll just let them uh, come in as they come in. So let's get started. So thanks, Pete, for coming along today. No problem. And we are going to be talking, well, probably going to be talking about lots of different things. Um, but in the main, I would like to talk about your new book, which has just mm -hmm. come out. I don't know if you've got a copy next to you that you can hold up. Uh, I have actually, <laughs> yes. Uh, I'm always one. doing things like this and I don't have a copy of my <laughs> book to hold up. So, yes. There it is. So here it is. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. I'm very glad that we can see the Titanic in the background. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, that's always there. Yes. Well, I did do, um, I'm, so I'm doing my master's dissertation at the moment and I've been doing interviews for it. And one of, I think she was, I think she was 14. Um, mm -hmm. One of my interviewees, her, one of her special interests was the Titanic. Oh, and she nice. was very, very keen to talk about it. So, and also um, Chloe, Chloe Hayden's one of her special interests is the Titanic as well. Is it really? I didn't know that. It is. Oh, yes, it I is. Really... She was she was in Ireland when we did our interview. Mm. You can see it yeah, on our YouTube channel. Um, but the the Titanic Museum was closed, unfortunately, uh, so she couldn't go. Hmm. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> okay. So first of all, perhaps I could ask you to give. A little intro to yourself. Um, I'm I'm mean, imagining that most people on here actually know you anyway. Um, but let's let's do this properly for everyone that might be watching on YouTube later. Mm -hmm. um, okay, yeah, I, I'm I'm Pete Warmby. I'm um, I used to be a teacher uh, for many 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 years. Uh, then I was diagnosed as being autistic in 2017, and then couldn't teach anymore eventually because. You know it's difficult um <laughs> and and now i i suppose I'm, I'm i'm an author primarily um and i do you know talks and lived experience explanations and all that kind of thing and uh, i do some training for the um at autism um charity and things like that so so yeah i've got a kind of varied thing that i do now um and yeah i'm two books in to author authoring so that's quite a nice position to be in and working on a third so yeah that's that's me that's exciting and I hadn't I haven't actually got a question about writing a third but I should have done so is there anything that you can tell us about that or is it just a big surprise well I've got three different ideas that I'm proposing um it's just basically a question of what order they come out in you know and, and also whether anyone wants to publish them obviously um yeah. you know, they, they might not want to um so so yeah there's, there's there's a few things you know something about um you know parenting uh something more dedicated just on education um and something more to do with travel they're they're the three I, I don't okay. want to go into much more detail no no, that, no that's, that's fine that's yeah, where I'm... Oh, how exciting okay right so I will get on the questions that I actually did prepare to, to ask you um <laughs> so I wanted to ask you how did you come to start posting about autism and advocacy particularly I think you started on Twitter mainly mm -hmm. and what were those what were those early days like um yeah good question I mostly started writing and tweeting um because I was trying to make sense of my own diagnosis and even like the process of diagnosis like I, I was blogging about that at the time you know six years ago or whatever um I think I started tweeting heavily in 2019 um and probably about the summer autumn of 2019 um because I just started doing these these threads you know like tweet after tweet just you know kind of exploring a different aspect of of, of you know my experience of being autistic and trying to make some sense of things and 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 people people like them, you know, and um, and they got they got a lot more engagement than I really ever expected them to, um, and yeah, it just kind of grew from there, really. Um, you know, I mean, ironically, I'm not I'm not on Twitter so much these days. Um, I've been on there recently because of the book. You know, I've kind of got to be, um, but apart from that, I, I I'm I'm not really. I, I find it too. 
um aggressive and stressful mm -hmm. and yeah. to too much kind of you know potential for falling out and stress so yeah I, I, I think it's a double-edged sword you know social media generally but but that's certainly how it started and um yeah it was it was it was positive back then you know generally speaking but um but yeah I'm trying to wean myself off a little bit these days mm -hmm. yeah I mean it, it is a double-edged sword because you could argue that maybe you wouldn't have we wouldn't have had two publishing contracts if you hadn't you oh know, no no got I mean big on yeah, Twitter. Sadly, I, uh, I, I owe everything to Twitter, which isn't a great position to be in, <laughs> especially these days. Um, yeah. But, you know, yeah, I mean, that, exactly. I mean, if it hadn't been for that, then that would never have happened, especially yeah. because I'm not a very proactive person. You know, I wouldn't have kind of gone out and asked for book contracts or anything. You know, they they, they came to me, you know. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, it, it, it did, you know, it was it was very helpful. Yeah, and I do think that there is a, there is a, well, there's a good and a bad, I guess, neurodivergent community on Twitter. Good and bad is not the right word, but never mind. Um, it, it is a really supportive community in one sense, isn't it? But it's also a quite a divided community. Is yeah. that what you found? Is that what you found stressful? It is, yeah. And and I I'm, I'm not a hugely comfortable person with um, with conflict. Um, and I'm I, I am very much a bit of a people pleaser. Um, I I. I like everyone just to feel comfortable and you know happy and safe you know and and sometimes on twitter it just feels like you can't say i don't, I don't want to sound too too grumpy about it but you know you, you, you there's that old thing isn't there you know you say you like muffins and somebody pops up saying what you're saying you hate pancakes and it's it's an atmosphere that i just can't stand i just can't yeah. bear it it's too stressful yeah. um so so yeah it's uh, people you're limited in what you write you're limited in your word count um and people fill in the gaps you know how how they want to fill in the gaps and that often leads to conflict which i think would be quite avoidable a lot of the time mm, yeah no i agree i agree definitely um okay and what you you're kind of you were still big on twitter i think when you were still teaching so mm, was that well, sort was of, that yeah. difficult to you know um do both at the same time if you see what like if you see what i mean yeah i suppose it was i think you know but by, by the time the the pandemic came around and i didn't really teach even though i was still technically a teacher i wasn't really teach, i was off sick for a very long time um it yeah it was it was difficult to balance um and i found it uh yeah tricky to 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 reconcile the two things especially because i'm often quite critical about the education system um you know i always felt like i had to be more you know very careful with that um and these days at least like i can be a bit more <laughs> free and easy with, with that kind of thing um yeah i mean i i I was never that. I mean, you know, I think by the time I finished teaching, I was probably at about 30,000 followers or something, which is a lot, you know, it's an awful lot, but it wasn't like, you know, impacting my, my life or anything that much. Um, you know, and school were really good at letting me go off to do like the National Autistic Society speech and stuff like that, like back in 2020. So yeah, it, well, it wasn't too bad. Um, you know, I just, I just saved it for the evenings. Mm -hmm. And looking back now, I know, the whole kind of um time that you were teaching there must have been some really difficult aspects to it obviously mm -hmm. because you, you had to leave um but w was there anything that kind of looking back now you think well actually that was a really positive aspect of, of being a teacher um yeah I, th I think certainly one of the best things about being a teacher who was quite open about being autistic was the um the impact that it certainly seemed to have at least on on some of the other autistic students you know who i taught um just in terms of you know feeling maybe more confident to come out of their shell a little bit more talk about their experience a bit more talk to me about you know our shared difficulties that we might have you know um and i've spoken about it quite a lot in the past but you know some of my fondest memories of that period was when um the the i mean i'm, I'm assuming neurotypical i mean obviously to be fair they may well not have been but you know they're, they're, certainly as far as their their um their plans and stuff said that they would have been neurotypical um those students kind of being quite fascinated in the discussions that i might have with some fellow autistic people um and that really helping a culture of 
yeah, it, it will be an okay, you know, acceptance and 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 that kind of thing. You know, I, I remember, you know, some non-autistic students just being genuinely quite interested in 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 the difference of experience um, and very positive about it and 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 kind of, you know, wow, I didn't get, I, mean, I, didn't, I didn't know that before, I didn't understand that before, but yeah, that makes sense. That's that 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 that's understandable, you know, that kind of thing and. Uh, and that was good you know that, that was something that I wish I could see replicated more you know yeah. <laughs> because yeah. you know often it's those peer peer relationships that can be so difficult for autistic students and I wonder sometimes whether it's just because autism is a bit of an unknown as far as the kids are concerned you know the, the neurotypical kids um, and they're just a bit frightened of it or or you know generally derogatory to it to, like in the same way that we tend to be derogatory to anything we don't fully understand you know as, as, a, as a species that's what we do sadly um so I, I do wonder whether you know if, if students just knew more about it and were more clued up about what it really means then they'd be you know more accepting and it'd still be fine you know <laughs> they, it doesn't yeah. Make wonder. yeah no we offer mentoring to autistic pupils but we um we say, you know, when the school buys it in, we say, really, this has to go along with whole school neurodiversity mm. training. Is training is not the right word, but you know, it, it's not going to work if you don't get everybody involved. Mm. Um, mm. But sadly, it's difficult to get. You know, funding is so difficult, isn't it? It's difficult to it get is. funding yes. for that. Yeah. So, okay, right. Let me find my word document that I haven't printed out. Um, what would you like teachers and health and social care professionals to know? I know that you've said that you would like them to be the main readers of your new book. Um, so what do you what do you want to tell them? <laughs> A lot. Um, <laughs> you can, yeah, you can I, say I as guess, much as you like. <laughs> I guess I want them to have a better understanding of the various and very different ways that autistic people can can present being autistic you know um so that there is less of that doubting that occurs i spoke about this in edinburgh as well um you know all too often there's this immediate sense of of mm, i don't believe you you know when autistic people try to explain their specific difficulties especially with things that might not seem consistent you know so for example when it comes to sensory issues um one day i don't know i or another autistic person might find sound particularly difficult and any kind of noise is great in the wrong way and just tension and hackles raised and just finding it really really difficult and then another day they might have no problem with it at all you know they, they might be absolutely fine with it and you know we know why that is that's because sensitivity towards various sensory things is heavily dependent on lots of other factors and you know we can be hypo and hyper sensitive you know as days go by um but they don't necessarily know that so they just think deception you know or attention seeking or whatever you know it's this immediate assumption of negative reasons you know that, that, that unfortunately is very prevalent um and yeah I, I i wish that there was more understanding about that um i wish there was a better understanding about the fact that um autistic people are heavily well <laughs> many most some autistic people are heavily traumatized um you, typically i would say the older they get the more traumatized they tend to be because of just how it works um especially by communication mishaps and miscommunication misinterpretation and things going wrong arguments you know just it, it, for some of us it can be uh, such a big part of our lives just being misunderstood and misunderstanding in return so frequently that that you know any com any any prospect of communication becomes stressful and something you don't want to have to face up to so you you clam up and there's generally not very much of an understanding of that um you know so so if we are for example selectively mute or you know non-speaking for a time or whatever it might be or we're in meltdown or shutdown or however you want to refer to those phenomena then um then there, there, there can be just again an assumption of this person is just being difficult and awkward with no compassion for the sheer quantity of horrendous experience that they probably experienced um, and I believe that if there was more of an understanding of that more of a realization that that is going on in the background and that is the kind of life that autistic people tend to lead then I think most people would probably be more compassionate and patient in the same way that we're patient and compassionate towards anyone that's clearly experiencing tough times um, so yeah that that would go a long way I think um, 
I, I genuinely think, I mean, obviously there's a lot of very practical stuff that needs to happen. There needs to be far less, you know, um, restraining in, in medical situations and there needs to be more money and funding and that kind of thing for various different, um, different, uh, you know, education, health, social care, etc. That all needs to happen. But a very simple thing that can also happen and also needs to happen is just this basic level of understanding that breeds compassion and patience, which is free. You know, compassion is free. Patience is free. Understanding can be free once you've got hold of a book or a person who's willing to tell you about it. Um, I'm just not seeing the will. You know, my, my biggest fear at the moment, for example, and I think it's backed up actually by engagement on social media, is that the majority of people that are reading my book and probably the majority of people that are reading Fern Brady's book and Chloe Hayden's book and, um, and, 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 and all of the other many, many very high quality books that are out there, they're autistic people, you know, and there's nothing wrong with that. Obviously, you know, we're looking for kinship. We're looking for shared understanding and shared experience. It's very valuable for that. But we're preaching to the choir, you know. Um, we need the non-autistic people to, to pick these things up and to read them, you know, and to, 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 to care. And, and my big worry is that that still isn't isn't happening you know um, most of the engagement I'm seeing on on social media about all of those books that I've discussed uh, is primarily from you know other neurodivergent people you know who are, who are happy to have found you know uh, a, a voice you know from someone who's similar to them but yeah we're, we're not punching through into that wider mm. that wider world and and mm. that that is it is frustrating and it's sad and it's it it it, it worries me you know that there yeah. isn't that will yeah. And of course, it, that misunderstanding or that lack of understanding can also be dangerous, can't it? It oh, can lead incredible. to it can lead yeah. to lots of dangerous situations. I mean, I've I've said this a few times now in different presentations. So apologies to anyone that's heard it before. Um, but, you know, for us, when so my daughter was diagnosed after massive or during massive mental health crisis. And so she was a child in need and social care were involved as well as CAMS and um, despite uh, a lot of people not you know not wanting social care involved they actually saved us because mm -hmm. there was there was so much lack of understanding there was a complete lack of understanding uh, among CAMS professionals for in our local area um, about any kind of um, you know knowledge about facial expressions or about um, emotional regulation or about emotion recognition and alexithymia and interoception and all of those things and so we had a situation where my daughter was saying uh, in in cams sessions my mum is always angry my and what she meant was my mum always has an angry face or of, often has an angry face but what Cam's didn't realize was that she couldn't recognize other emotions. So yeah. she rec she recognized the big emotions, the early developmental emotions like happy, sad, fear, anger. But when she could say that it wasn't happy and it wasn't sad and it couldn't be fear because of the context, everything else became anger. Yeah. Uh, because yeah. she couldn't distinguish that it was frustration or disappointment or whatever it might be. And so um, we almost got into big trouble because we were always angry with her apparently mm. and it was only it was actually only social care that stopped that turning into something bigger yeah. it's and so, so scary. yeah it is scary because these things happen and um professionals have no understanding of neurodiver you know we're all neurodivergent they have no understanding of neurodivergent families no. and they are they apply neurotypical frameworks of, of their work to them uh, without any knowledge that it, it's just not appropriate at all yeah um, and so you know you wonder what's happening what's happening in secret children's courts for example mm. um and that's that's quite scary isn't it it is it is you know i mean ignorant <laughs> ignorance is probably the dangerous the, the most dangerous thing that exists you know the the, the damage that can be done I, i'll never forget um I'm an English teacher, so I used to teach Christmas Carol an awful lot. Um, and there's a moment in the book, at least, it's not always in the cartoon versions, you know, but um, where the ghost of Christmas present has these two figures hiding within his robes. Uh, one is ignorance and one is want or poverty. And um, yeah, the, the ghost points out, you know, beware ignorance the most. 
for that is doom you know that that is where doom lies and and i think about that so often in the in the way that things are these days you know and and yeah when it comes to autism awareness you know we talk endlessly about autism awareness we'll be talking about it again in a few weeks you know for a whole month um autism awareness this and that and the other um and yeah it's not there <laughs> it isn't no there. Well, it's changed it's to autism acceptance now which I don't, I don't not necessarily sure is better but anyway yeah well it's, it's like <laughs> that, that's it's a good change so long as the awareness is already there and I think you know I mean I've, I've pushed for that in the past but but then you think actually still the awareness isn't there and we're still you know dealing with massive problems as a result because yeah it's um it's a huge huge problem um and i think that people like myself and many others you know um try to address it address it but we're we're met with silence you know and we're met with um with with, with a neurotypical population that doesn't appear to really even know it's a problem you know and and, and that's that's stressful yes yes it is so let's go back to um school for a moment for the next mm -hmm. question. And I'm gonna ask you something, um, which I hope doesn't put you on the spot too much. Um, you know, whatever answer you give is, <laughs> is fine. Um, but if you were thinking about your ideal school, hmm. what, what would we be looking at? Um, tremendous flexibility, I think, as far as possible. First of all, there would be a staff body that would be as completely clued up on modern understanding of neuro neurodivergency as is plausible you know which which i think is it would, would be pretty clued up you know it doesn't take that much you know <laughs> you, you could you know you could cover a lot of information a lot of ground in a few decent training sessions you know um so you, you'd have a staff body that really got it and really understood you know and and who would take responsibility for how they treat and how they work with autistic or adhd or otherwise neurodivergent students um and as a result then there would be a potential and a possibility for, for more flexibility of teaching styles and activities and you know little things like you know we know that this student for example does not work well with group work you know they, they do not deal with that and we're not going to force the matter because the thing that gets me about education and you see this from uh, on education on education twitter quite a lot is this belief that we've got to force autistic people to do this stuff because they're going to have to do it as adults so things like eye contact, um, group work, uh, you know, physical stuff that they might not be comfortable with, sensory stuff they might not be comfortable with. There's this sense of, yeah, no, we, you know, they might not like it, but, you know, tough love. We're going to make them, you know, do it anyway because it's for the best. And it's not very far removed from ABA as a concept. Not really. You know, you're forcing them to do things that they really cannot do in the in the belief that you know better and you are in a position of you know power and benevolence you know um and and i i believe that that is something that needs to be systematically removed from the entire system this belief that um neurodivergent students have to be forced to conform for their own good because typically of course when an autistic child becomes an autistic adult we have the freedom and the autonomy to choose whether we make eye contact or not. We have the freedom and the autonomy to choose whether we want to work in a profession where group work is essential or whether we can maybe find some kind of work which is very solitary and lonesome, which might suit our needs. So that there's a short sightedness there that, that's, again, very dangerous, you know, and, and, and we're forcing autistic students to do things that can be uncomfortable in a way that I think many people could never imagine. You know, like when you talk about eye contact, you know, that there's always this general sense, I think, that autistic people don't like eye contact in the same way as some people might not like reading or something. Like, mm -hmm. you know, we don't like it, but it's fine. We just don't like it. Whereas it's actually far more similar to the way somebody, somebody might not like being tickled or the way that somebody might not like... Um, well, I don't know, you know, being, you know, it's, it's more visceral than that. And it's more potent than that. And it's more devastating than that when we're forced to do it. You know, we all know how it feels to be tickled against our will, you know, especially if we're really tickly. And, it, and it, you know, it's a loss of power. It's a loss of control. I mean, I think it's often classed as abuse these days, which it should be, you know. And, and I think that actually, you know, enforcing eye contact isn't far removed from that. You know, it's a, it's a very physical 
painful, unpleasant thing to experience. But again, there's no understanding of this. There's no acceptance of it. And if anyone such as myself or anyone else online ever suggests it, we're often met with a kind of, nah, you know, you're just, you just, no, you're just trying to cause a fuss. You know, you're just trying to make problems where there are none, you know, um, and, and that, you know, <laughs> it's frustrating um so yeah yeah you've uh, yes I, I i was very much in this frame of mind in edinburgh on um on tuesday when i did a panel up there for the uh, it takes all kinds of minds conference you know I'm, I'm very much in the mindset at the moment of um you know ah <laughs> we, need, we need real change um so so yeah that that's the kind of mood you've caught me in yeah okay um and of course we what we need is a mainstream curriculum but in an environment that that can be coped with by autistic pupils and often that is not a mainstream secondary school you know which yeah. if you think of mainstream secondary schools in in big cities can be you know 5,000 people um, mm -hmm. even even not in big cities they can easily be 2,000 people and is it ever possible that an autistic pupil is going to be comfortable in a school of 2000 people yeah that's a yeah. that's a pretty difficult ask mm -hmm. isn't it it is um, it is so you know do we need i th i think what we need is is more you know middle ground we, we don't necessarily need more special schools um often the special schools don't offer a curriculum that is suitable mm -hmm. um of course in some instances they do um but we need more nurturing environments i think that offer yeah. a mainstream yeah. curriculum yeah. and that's the difficulty isn't it because because of, they are more expensive because they have fewer uh, they have smaller class sizes and yes. they probably have a greater um, adult ratio to children um, um, than a mainstream yeah. school so that's the difficulty isn't it getting those funded yeah. it was interesting actually because i'm because i'm doing this dissertation and i'm doing it on um our white paper and the checklist that's in it for a, about an internal presentation of autism and so i've been doing these interviews and um the checklist was written really with a mainstream school in mind for the mm -hmm. school there's there's different sections and there's a section on school and the section in school contains things like statements like uh, you know, may find it difficult to put your hand up in class or may not want to be called on in class. And so a couple of my interviewees were from Limpsfield Grange, um, which um, is the only autistic, sorry, the only school for autistic girls in the UK, yeah. the only state school. And actually their answers skewed my data a bit because of course they're in an environment that at the, like you just talked about where all of the teachers do understand their presentation do understand what they find difficult and so actually they were answering oh no I, you know i don't mind talking don't in mind. class i don't yeah. mind you know i will put my hand up actually i like putting my hand up because i mm -hmm. want to talk you know mm -hmm. especially if it's something i want to talk about um <laughs> and so yeah i'm gonna have to pull out that that data and you know talk about that because obviously that's a completely different kettle of fish. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it, but, but, how but, it is in a mainstream school. Yeah, I mean, it, but it, but it's tremendously um, enlightening, isn't it? You know, just just how it's it's that whole idea. That, you know, do we really know what a non-traumatized autistic person would be like? You know, and, and mm. <laughs> I mean, obviously, there, there must be plenty of them. But um, you know, we, we, I suppose it, you know it's possible, and and then we can presumably then you know we can live our best lives and be happy or at least you know seek happiness fairly and in, a, in an equal kind of way to everyone else yeah. um yeah yeah and and the the idea that these schools that do get it right and, and and where staff do understand and the kids are like yeah this is this is fine <laughs> you know i enjoy school um you know it's, it's both tragic and hopeful at the same time i think yeah, and and they were also, you know, what another one of the statements or one of the questions at the end was, do you have uh, someone at school that you can talk to and who listens to you? Not necessarily understands you because, well, how would you know if someone understands you or not? Um, but yeah, the Limpsfield Grange students all said yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, what a difference that makes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Actually, this follows on quite nicely to my next question, which is as an autistic adult what do you believe um goes into making a happy life 
<laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's going to be different for everyone, I think. Um, yeah. for, for, for my particular flavour of, of autisticness, um, I think time alone is important for me um, personally in order to really thrive you know and 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 be able to um it's something that you know dates back i remember when chris packham did his first documentary on on being asperger's you know back in how, how many years ago it was now this this was just around the time that i was getting diagnosed or had just been diagnosed and um and he talked about you know like living alone in the new forest and that little cottage he's got you know and having that room where he can just go to be completely lonesome and i was like <laughs> oh my god you know i want that <laughs> that's that that would be you know that's bliss you know for me but obviously it's not for everyone there's plenty of very you know gregarious autistic people who probably want people around them all the time you know large families and so on and so forth i guess it comes down to autonomy and i think a lot of autistic people don't have that um you know that independence where we we either have it taken from us by uh, by the state sometimes obviously or, or by the people around us or by you know parents partners families whoever it might be school teachers etc cetera, etc cetera. and um and i think that could be quite devastating you know if, if, if you lose that um because then whatever your needs are will always be a struggle because you know you haven't got the freedom to, to try and find them and if you try to explain what they are how many people are going to listen or care um this is this is very strong on my mind at the moment for the, you know the work i'm doing for the at autism and anna freud um center you know because it's all about you know training people not to you know restrain autistic people for example or or, or you know um and to listen and to care and be interested in what they need um so yeah i think autonomy is a key thing um and i think that um that freedom to pursue whatever it might be. I mean, obviously, everyone knows that I'm very, very passionate about, you know, what I continue to call special interests. I know that the term is controversial, but I stand by it because I like to try and reclaim the word special, I think. Um, it, you know, I'm, I'm hugely passionate about that stuff and, and how beneficial they can be for, you know, certainly a lot of autistic people, if not all of them. Um, and I think that freedom to pursue our interests and to be free to do it without either being told that we either can't or or that there's something shameful to it, or, or that you know we have to we have to like more normal things, you know, or, or whatever it might be. I think that's a crucial part too, certainly for for a lot of autistic people, you know, just that that sense that yeah, we we are allowed to pursue these things that we are genuinely interested in. Mm. Yeah, my son's going to uh, the first session of an adult Lego club this this Saturday. Oh, nice. so. <laughs> so we'll see how that goes. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I mean, I think that. That, that yeah I mean you're absolutely right it's going to be different for everybody of course um but I do think I do think the the special or, or passionate interests part is something that it's it's difficult isn't it to impress upon neurotypical people how important that is yeah how do we how do we do that how do we well you wrote a book about it <laughs> but, <laughs> but how, how do we convince people that that is one of the most important things yeah uh, well uh, you, you would think it would be easy because like with most things that autistic people experience they're not completely unheard of or unknown in the non-autistic population you know like like I've, I've talked about in the past you know for example you know sensory overwhelm isn't unique to autistic people we just tend to get it a lot more often because of the way that our brains work you know most non-autistic people will at least recognize aspects of it and you would think that that would breed yeah you know compassion and understanding um you know because obviously non-autistic people have hobbies and things that they really care about and things that they would you know be sad if they were taken away it's just far. i think i think it's fair to say more intense for for, for autistic people but yeah there isn't that leap that leap isn't made and, and you know special interests are still viewed as being alien or weird in some way even though they're really not they're just perhaps potentially a just more intense form of something that most people might actually recognize in themselves um so instead you know we, we, we just have to kind of keep shouting keep talking keep keep sharing um the, the problem is it comes at tremendous personal cost you know all of these autistic people sharing online exhausting themselves 
you know, feeling like they're not being listened to. So is it even worth it? You know, is is this is this for the best? Um, you know, the, it's 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 a hard thing to to do. You know, and and I think it's fair to say. I mean, I I notice you know quite frequently that people who I remember used to tweet a lot or or whatever, you just realise you haven't seen them for a long time. You know, and then they're not doing it anymore. You know, and, and I guess that's me now as well. You know, and there are other people that have taken over. You know, there are other people that are doing it as well. But how long will they last before they burn out? You know, and and you know, it's it's it, this churn of you know autistic people and ADHD people. You know, trying to raise awareness by you know talking about their own interests, burning out, retreating, and never really presumably feeling that did I make a difference? Did I help at all? Is it's best almost not to think about it because it's quite a harrowing thought, you know, that there's this kind of growing pile of, of, of neurodivergent people who have tried desperately to improve things by sharing their painful experiences, you know, personal lives and, you know, very intimate things often. And, you know, then just can't do any more and that pile will continue to grow. And are we making a dent? I mean, I feel like we are, but it's a you know at what cost it yeah I do I feel like we need to kind of step back every so often and think okay what was it like five years ago what was it like 10 years ago yes it's and if bad. we do that then then we know that there has been a dent made there has been a difference definitely but yeah okay um let's quickly talk about being a parent um many of the people certainly um within our Facebook group um, many people are parents um, of autistic, usually girls, but not always. Um, and I know that you're a parent and obviously I'm a parent. How do you think life change, obviously life changes for everyone when they become a parent, of course. Uh, but how do you think it changed for you in terms of, for example, you've said being alone is really important to you it's harder isn't it it's harder to be alone when you're a parent yeah um yeah they, for, for me that there were a combination of several things that all kind of happen in unison as they will do when you become a parent to a small thing screaming and needing to sleep and eat and so um yeah but the, the the loss of um alone time loss of time for special interests um, and the destruction of a kind of routine, whatever routine you built for yourself. Um, they were probably the three big things that made it tremendously difficult for me. It, I, and because I didn't know I was autistic at this point, I had no way of knowing that that was going to happen. You know, I hadn't clocked that how important my routine was to me. I Obviously, I had one. I'd forged one, you know, as autistic people often do. You know, we, 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 we force a routine around us because we have to have something that we have some control over, you know, in order to be able to cope. Um, but I had no understanding that I, I, how much I needed any of these things until they were taken away, you know, until they were they weren't available anymore. Um, and yeah, I mean that 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 did a bit of a number on my mental health, you know, <laughs> to be quite honest. Um, and and it led directly to to getting diagnosed ultimately because you know I had to work out why you know what why why was I struggling the way that I was so um so so yeah I um it, it, it was a real struggle it was it was very very difficult to, to 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 manage to handle that massive shift especially because of course both because I wasn't diagnosed but even if I had been diagnosed there wouldn't have been any support um not in any meaningful sense you know um I remember going to NCT classes and you know they, they, they didn't have like a unit on being an autistic parent you know that, did, that didn't exist I don't know whether it does now uh, but it certainly didn't back in 2015 or whenever um so so yeah you know <laughs> I feel like a lot of this could be you know if 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 there were you know um if there was an effort made to educate autistic potential parents you know or, or just just inform autistic adults of you know by the way you know the, you, you you probably do these things and if you have a child you might lose some of it so be ready for that be prepared for that have a support network around you make sure that you know what you're going to be dealing with that would presumably go an awfully long way um if that kind of thing were to exist and i think it's starting to you know there are there are there are you know organizations out there now that are starting to address that of course back in the past there was an assumption that autistic people didn't have kids <laughs> you know that it wasn't something that anyone needed to worry about i think um happily we're more you know enlightened now um 
but yeah, I, th- I think you know the, the the upheaval of routine alone is going to cause a lot of autistic parents quite a lot of problems. You know, um, just because it's such a massive shift to compared mm. to what you were used to. Yeah, and of course, when your child starts school, not necessarily straight away. Um, but at some point you probably are going to come up against some of the things that perhaps you came up against at school mm-hmm. or because because the school system is quite different now and more rigid and more you know there's much more concentration on exams etc maybe mm-hmm. maybe school wasn't so difficult for you but it might be for your child and mm-hmm. does it do you kind of start thinking how am I going to support my child to get through school oh absolutely I mean every day yeah. <laughs> you know every, every day you got to got to be thinking about the potential issues and and we have we have pretty fruitful conversations a- around that kind of thing uh I mean they're, they're not diagnosed um because we just haven't pursued that yet you know but I mean I, <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty confident um that, that they are autistic uh, so so we talk regularly about things that I can at least try to predict might be an issue or might prove difficult you know friendship issues difficulties in the playground you know explanations of what bullying might actually look like you know because I know I remember you know when I was a kid because social interactions and behaviors are quite difficult for me to interpret you know I tend to I tend to read everyone as coming from a place of positivity you know, even even until prove, clearly proven otherwise, you know, I, I tend to still stick and, and hold on to this belief that everyone is nice fundamentally, which isn't necessarily something we all share. But I think it's something that's I, I've heard a lot of autistic people say that they have a similar kind of naivety. You know, um, it's not really naivety, though. It's more just a really it's actually really nice. You know, It's just like, I, you know, surely isn't everyone nice? You know, I, I think it's quite a, I think it's quite a good thing, really. But it causes huge problems because people aren't, you know, people are all kinds of things, you know, and, and manipulative and dangerous and everything so so I, I like to you know just clarify you know what behavior to keep an eye out for what's okay behavior what's not okay behavior that kind of thing you know and we talk about it frequently we really do we're, we're a very open household with that kind of thing you know um although I must I don't think she'll mind me saying this but even like my my, my sister um hasn't you know realized that the you know she's almost certainly autistic herself and and and, and <laughs> she's been reading my book and her daughter said things about you know i'm am I autistic i mean there's all this kind of thing so we've got a nice kind of open dialogue about it you know within our extended family i think now uh which is nice and you know even my, my dear old dad you know is pretty much you know he's he's accepting now about his own life you know and mm. and it's good it's, it's healthy it's a nice way to be and and, and um it's not always possible it's not always easy and not everyone will be able to replicate that you know for various reasons because you know there's dangers and everything that could could occur but um I, I i'm i'm a great believer in openness about this sort of thing you know remove the taboo remove that sense of it being you know ooh, a bit off topic you know a bit, bit, bit a bit bit of a dodgy area to talk about with your kids you know no i think it's important that we know how we work and, and we know what our capacity for things might be and what we might be vulnerable to and and that kind of thing yeah and of course it's a question that comes up quite a lot in in our Facebook group is you know my maybe my child is is younger maybe my child is you know six or seven and they've been diagnosed when should I tell them you know this comes up Mm. quite a lot Mm. and our answer is always you should tell them now (laughs) you should tell them straight away Um, but you know it's sometimes that message is not Uh, echoed by professionals and we do you know we do hear about professionals saying oh no you don't want to tell them yeah you don't want to label them all of those things that thing about labeling I know it's so frustrating (laughs) it's like it's like someone's decided at some point in the past that any label is a bad thing like you know you know labeling's bad you know we don't and it, it just it just makes me want to scream because it's like well it's not labeling it's identifying who you are <laughs> what's wrong yes. with that yes. but yeah you come up across it all the time and yeah it's 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 intensely difficult to keep <laughs> I mean, I, I like to think I'm quite an easygoing kind of guy, but it's difficult to keep, you know, um, magnanimous in the face of that. You just kind of want to say, come on, it's not just labelling for the sake of it. It's actually identifying who you are and what you need, 
you know I mean that's not a bad thing yes but yeah that's that's the way yeah, it is and I was on a community of practice uh, recently for an area that I probably shouldn't mention I won't mention where it is um but they have um in their in their effort I think I think it came from a good place in their mm -hmm. effort to want to put support in place for people who are on the waiting list they have stopped all referrals and they have only assessed two people since November last year. And so they are they are entirely missing the whole the whole Problem. identity part yeah. of the equation. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which yeah. <laughs> once I it, it started off quite well, but once I heard that, yeah, it it, mm. it disintegrated a bit. Well, okay. It, certainly, it helps to explain why I'm waiting for my ADHD referral, doesn't it? You know, it's been what, two, yes. two, years, three years, I think, from counting. I emailed them the other day, and they were just like, "Nah," you know. No, sorry. some. I mean, some areas are dreadful. My, I'm in Warwickshire, and um, at one point, the waiting list was five years for autism. Yep. Um, but it's it has gone down considerably because they failed their Ofsted send inspection, uh, and it was put on the it was put on the areas of concern. Anyway, right, let me just check my list of questions to make sure there isn't one that's really, really important that, um, oh, I just, let me just, because we haven't talked very much about untypical. So tell us about a bit about untypical and why you wrote it. And then I will go to questions from the audience quickly. Okay. Um, I wrote it because, well, in part, people kept saying back in the day I mean years ago now when I used to do those big threads you know can't you just put all these in a big book <laughs> you know can't you just take all of these things that you're writing about and just whack them in a big book so everyone can read it easily and and, and that played on my mind you know I mean I would have looked to it and then and then you know in all fairness Harper Collins got in touch and were like would you like to write a book and I thought oh well here's here's the opportunity <laughs> you know? so the idea behind it is is I, I wanted to do two things for two different people you know I wanted to um be a source of any comfort it can be for fellow neurodivergent people you know if it can be if it helps if it helps you kind of find acceptance or you know shared experience then that's great you know i'd be very happy with any autistic person who reads it and thinks you know even just once oh i have that too thank god it's not just me you know that that, that that's a huge part of it for me um, because i benefited so much from reading that kind of thing myself when I was first diagnosed. Um, but secondly, and, and, it, and, a, and a big thing with this book is I wanted to educate people that don't know anything about it, you know, I, 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 you know, because because that's so important. Um, and I've had to wrestle quite heavily with the with the idea of, well, you know, what gives me the right to do that? You know, like, why do I get to do that? And, and it's a difficult question. You know, I mean, obviously, somebody's given me the opportunity, so I'd be kind of silly not to at least try um but yeah I, I don't want to speak for everyone I don't want to be like you know oh this is what I've decided you need to know about autism you know I've tried to make it as open as I can you know and try to make it as clear as I can that you know this is just this is what I know about autism and here it is so that you know it too now um and that might help um and much of the last chapter of the book is spent in me kind of you know explaining this shouldn't be it you know if, if you do happen to be non-autistic and you've read this then great but do not make it the last thing you read because that's limiting yourself you know you got to go out there you got to widen your experience then you know and, and read upon the intersectionality really get to grips with how it's different for everyone all the many different you know um uh, groups, de demographics of individuals who, who will have a very different experience of their being autistic, you know, go out there and find out about that. Um, so yeah, that, that's, you know, I wanted to start, you know, be a kind of, here's like a, like a, a beginner's guide, you know, like here's some information for you to do with as you will, and now go off and build on that please you know that's that's the that's the message that i tried to build into it um and time will tell you know whether that worked or not yeah okay right i've got a question um here any tips to get schools involved in learning more about autism not just teacher training but whole school including including pupils um i think that there are vast numbers of autistic speakers out there um you know you go on linkedin you type in autistic speaker and you'll find tens hundreds of, of of potential you know candidates and and it's about getting them you know getting them in and getting them speaking and getting them talking to the staff but also the students um you know assemblies 
that can be a really powerful thing chatting with small groups um you know you, you want to be you want to be encouraging the schools to maybe look beyond their standardized kind of list of training providers you know the ones that come in year on year and maybe spread the net a bit wider you know see who else is out there in the local area who can come in who's you know who talks about their own experience of being autistic and who who can maybe share some of that intersectionality as well ideally you know um i mean that's crucial obviously for you know for, for women for for people ethnic minorities things like that you know to make sure that a school that knows where its own limitations are and where its own lack of understanding lies can get someone in to address those exact areas you know and 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 that could be tremendously powerful you know to get somebody in who who can who can you know say this is my experience it may well chime with a lot of your students and also teachers so it's, it's about you know taking a bit of a you know taking a punt you know and and and, and getting people in and and finding out what they've got to say and you know and paying them for their time as well which is something i feel very strongly about because all too often we're invited to do things and there's a kind of understanding that you know we'll do it for free because it's i don't know publicity or something i mean you know <laughs> that's one thing if you've got a book out but if you literally try to make ends meet you know you, you got to be paid for your time um so so yeah you know i i think that there's there's a but parents can put a bit of pressure on them, i think parents can put pressure on schools that can happen maybe more easily at primary level but it's possible at secondary as well you know having been on that you know on the other side you know parental pressure can, can, can work wonders so so yeah you know I could continue to ask you know um the senko for example you know have you got anyone in have you brought anyone in to talk about this stuff have you have you brought in autistic um you know um uh, young adults you know to talk to some of the students and you know to, to to act as like mentors and that kind of thing or or just to share experiences have you done this have you done this have you done that you know guilt trip them into, <laughs> into doing something a bit more tangible um because all too often for autistic students what they really need more than anything is some role model you know a, a, a figure who's autistic you know i mean obviously you know you know you know emily you know emily you know, someone someone like that you know someone who's got that um lived experience but is also just a fantastic role model you know and just just a you know a young person who's who's who's, who's out there and living you know and doing stuff and getting things done and you know they, they, it's a powerful thing yeah you know, perhaps, necessarily... perhaps i should say for everyone um emily is one of our trustees um yeah. she's a she's a young trustee um and she was uh she won't mind me saying because um she puts it in her bio um she was diagnosed after she was sectioned um she's now been diagnosed adhd as well no no surprise to me whatsoever um and yeah she was she has been involved in our charity since we became a charity so she was only 19 when she became a trustee with us and she's brilliant yeah okay so the next question is um i find the relentlessness of keeping advocating for my son at school so exhausting there are people who understand him but not enough and the overarching school agenda means that needs aren't always met uh, or or met enough even with people fighting his corner do you think there will ever be more positive overarching change to make schools feel safer for autistic students yeah it's it's a difficult one and, and i don't like to get too political but i think there is a political element here um i've witnessed the school system change in the time that i was a teacher you know i started teaching in 2008 which was still under the old um you know labor government back then um and i stopped in 2021 so i saw i, I saw an awful lot of change and and some of that change was a depersonalization a focus on data a focus on grades a focus on um, academic achievement above all else you know and and part of me does worry that you know that it, it might take large scale change at the very top to, to to challenge that you know schools are after all beholden to the department of education they have to be that's how it works that's how the hierarchy operates in this country um so so sadly you know that that kind of systemic change is is more difficult when it's not you know coming from the very top of the tree um but having said that we are still forcing some change but you're right it's exhausting to do it for yourself all the time um and i haven't got any certainly nothing's coming to mind in terms of a quick fix you know or an easy answer for that you know it's it is exhausting and i guess when you're doing the advocacy again 
well, when, you know, when you're talking to the schools that you, that you that you have to talk to, see if you can push them towards finding out more online and you know listening to autistic voices, so that you don't have to do quite so much yourself. You know, but but you know we can only lead a horse to water; we can't make them drink ultimately. And that's that's I think where the that's where the culture and the philosophy and yet yeah, the politics of it all comes in you know that's that it, that's what's going to cause the willingness to drink unfortunately you know and, and, and that's hard to change on our own yeah you know that's very difficult to change um so unfortunately we just have to kind of keep cracking on and um and, and hoping that there is a culture shift at some point in the future where schools rediscover <laughs> probably in trouble for this but rediscover that they are nurturers as well as educators um you know some schools have got that nailed down still you know they, they, they have their you know they, they know that and that they they work with that and they do well others maybe not so much um and we can only hope that some you know that, that in the future that is rediscovered by those establishments okay um, the next question, um, any suggestions of where to go if the NHS waiting list for an assessment takes too long? Private organisations, I'm in the East Midlands. That might be a bit difficult for you to answer. <laughs> yes, it is. Um, I mean, it's something I've considered, but private's so blooming expensive that it's not really feasible for, for many people, I don't think. Um, all I can really say is there's nothing wrong with self-diagnosis, in my personal opinion. You know, if, if you can't afford and, you know, if you're on a waiting list, and you can't afford a private diagnosis what are you meant to do you know you're not suddenly neurotypical because of that you know if, if you are neurodivergent you have been your entire life or your child has been their entire life nothing's going to stop that or change that um and if you've done the research and if you know them and if you've seen the connection between their behavior or your behavior and the diagnostic criteria as it stands then i'm not going to stand in your way you know personally and i would recommend anyone else not to but obviously that's it's easier said than done because you know often you you need that piece of paper or you need that official word for anyone to take it seriously but you know that, that but i i feel strongly that self-diagnosis means something you know it's, it's it's important yeah it's absolutely our ethos in autistic girls network that self-diagnosis is valid um however uh sorry i don't know who it was that asked the question um elmi um, if you join our Facebook group, if you're in our Facebook group, you can ask that question in the group and there will be local people yeah. who will be able to recommend yeah. um, private practitioners to you. OK, um, next question. I think we've only got two more questions and then we're going to stop. So um, don't don't put any more questions in the chat. Um, I read what I want to talk about and so many things resonated. Are there strong communities for autistic men you were aware of as there are for women? not not that i'm aware of community the, the informal communities like you know on twitter and on um instagram perhaps nothing nothing more formal that i'm aware of. i mean to be honest i'm a very solitary person so i'm not the kind of person that would typically go looking for that kind of thing anyway you know um it, it was a, it was a crucial part to chapter five i think of that book um but i certainly you know in that instance i was talking more from the first perspective of others than of my own kind of experience because as I say I'm quite happy alone but there isn't much out there I mean it was very interesting to me one of the reviews for untypical that you know just dropped on uh, Amazon in the last couple of days was was saying something about you know oh here we've actually got a book about being autistic from a middle-aged British man you know and, and kind of lamenting the fact that there isn't that much from it's, in, it's interesting because there's the stereotype that all autistic people are male you know that still kind of persists in some quarters and you know for a long long time all the literature was dominated by boys and men all of it was um but but i think you know when it comes to that kind of more modern style autistic biography autistic people talking about their experience um that, that there isn't a huge amount especially in the uk because as this reviewer put maybe autistic maybe british men are just too reticent you know we don't want to talk about stuff like that because of we're British men, you know, and there's this cultural thing that we just don't, we don't open up about our vulnerabilities and we don't, we don't show that we have these difficulties in things. And I think that is a bit of a cultural thing and it is interesting, but yeah, I'm not aware of any kind of, you know, autistic specific groups for autistic men that exist. Um, I, I presume there might be some, but I'm not, like I say, I'm not really the person to ask because I'm such a 
hermit <laughs> naturally you know by by instinct that i don't I, I would never go off to try and find these things but i hope they exist i really do because it's if i would if i were trying to find one i probably would start with men's sheds and talk to them yes. and see if see if they've got any kind of offshoot or talk to yeah. them about talk to them about doing an offshoot if if they mm. haven't got one because it sounds like something that's definitely needed okay right i've got the last question here um, and uh, Catherine says, I am encountering patients who are at their wits end because their teenage autistic sons are angry and violent at times and parents whose teenagers won't leave their bedroom and are spending days playing games on the computer. The school system is punishing the parents through fines. Any advice? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um... There's a lot there to unpack. I would say that with the, with the anger and the violence, you've got to try and identify what's the root cause. Um, autistic children, um, and I suppose boys perhaps in particular, may well be very isolated um, and very, very vulnerable to online um, hate, I believe. I, I think that there is a real risk there. So it's worth looking into whether that's going on, I suppose. Um, it's autistic violence is often linked or related to meltdown, or as some of us still call it meltdown, you know, sensory overload, or however you want to describe it. And that, that violence, when it occurs, is very frequently not intentional. You know, it's it's a it's a result of reaching a limit um, that you can't have much control over because you know you're you're at the absolute limit of what you can cope with as a human being. Um, so so yeah, it's very difficult because all too often these behaviours are viewed as negative and problematic and the fault of the individual, when the reality may well be that they are actually massive signifiers of distress and hurt and pain and all the rest of it you know the autistic trauma the autistic people people suffer so so you've got to be you've got to be compassionate when you're looking for the root cause you know if, if a student if, 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 if an autistic child is spending all of their waking moments on, on a particular video game obviously there's a special interest element going on there you know I would say pretty likely but also is it just a way of not having to address the stresses and the traumas of the real world the trauma of trying to communicate with other people um you know have they decided that the people around them are no longer safe for them and the only safety they can find is in the sol the solace of their video game i can certainly relate to that um you, you've got you've got to take a step back and be creative in how you interpret these behaviors and try and work out what what's going on in the background here you know why are they coming into bed every night? Well, what is it that they're that they're afraid of? And and to try and take a step back from the the feeling of ah this is awful and this is causing us harm and pain. Well, there's probably a lot of harm and pain going on for them, and we've got to unpick it and try and work out exactly where it is. I mean, I can't give much more advice than that. I mean, it's it's every situation is going to be different, and uh, you know it's it's a huge huge thing um but yeah just take care in interpretation of the behavior you know take real care and real empathy and compassion even when the behavior comes across as very bad and very potentially harmful be compassionate and trying to work out what's driving it um, I think is always the safest and most kind way to, to, to approach it. And and the in a in a sense, the answer to questions like this is always the same: is that you have to upskill yourself on understanding, and everyone around that child has to upskill themselves on understanding. Um, not that I want to parent blame at all, um, but if you understand what's going on then you're going to be able to put things into practice which make it a bit better. It's not going to solve everything and it's certainly not going to solve everything overnight because it will have taken time to get to that place in the first place. Mm -hmm. 
but yeah that's that's the key is is really making sure that you immerse yourself and that you understand um but of course you know 50 percent at least of parents are going to be autistic themselves even if they don't know it yet uh, which adds an extra layer of complication doesn't it, it does. yeah yeah okay right any last thing you want to say pete about the book um well i mean it's available buy it <laughs> <laughs> yeah so by all means get yourself a copy i don't mind where you get it from it doesn't make any difference to me because harper collins are quite pleasant with their terms and conditions so it's fine um you know if you're not a fan of amazon then by all means don't feel pressured to buy on amazon you know um go to your local bookshop get it ordered in you know have a coffee read a bit you know that's that's the way um yeah but but you know it's out there if you want to read it give it a go see what you think okay right i promised you actually i have broken my promise a little bit because uh, we are a couple of minutes over what i said <laughs> um but yeah i promised you that we would keep it tight um i'm hoping that we haven't made your headache worse no i'm okay to be honest it, it, it had started to go off by about 10 o'clock so i'm i'm doing all right good good okay well thank you ever so much pete for joining us um hopefully you'll come and join us for the next book whenever that yes. might be <laughs> Indeed, yeah. um, and thank you everyone else for giving up your time um in the day to come and see us uh, this has recorded so uh, we will put it on our youtube channel um uh -huh. as soon as, as soon as i get a moment to do that i will do that okay thanks everybody bye thank you. bye, -bye. bye.